right. Here we go. Hello, hey. Mr. Shahan. Just in the nick of time. Outstanding. <laughs> Hello. Sorry, I sorry, I got invalid link the first time and couldn't find another one. Then I tried this again and it worked. <laughs> All right. No worries. All right. Well, um, attendees, I want to thank you all for joining us. We are delighted to have our editors reconvene today. In case you haven't noticed, we've had a lot that's happened since we last met. Elections, 2020 commercial successes, an ITC extension, formation of a new trade association, and potential light at the end of the COVID tunnel. Uh, and then there's that little thing of the riot last week and what it means to the mood of this country and the confidence that nations around the world would have in us. So we've got our editors for the first time coming together since all that has happened and we're delighted to hear from them. I think the reason why these roundtables are so popular with in clean tech circles is it's, it's a way for us to hear from people who have a unique vantage point. They have an endless stream of pitches, development and big news that they see. Collectively, they put together a pretty compelling mosaic of, of where the landscape is. And I think um, people really enjoy hearing that. So without further ado, I'm Mike Casey and I, I run the clean economy, Marcom and public affairs firm called Tigercom. But more importantly, here are the editors and I'm gonna just ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Heather. Hey, I'm Heather Clancy, the editorial director at GreenBiz. I'm Catherine Morehouse. I'm an editor and, and reporter at Utility Dive. Darius? Yes, I'm Darius Sneakers. I'm editor chief at Recharge. I'm Zachary Shahan, uh, editor in chief and CEO at Clean Technica. Great. All right, folks, uh, let me just do a go around here. My first question for you is how did Clean Economy do in 2020, all things considered? Um, Catherine, can I start with you? Sure. Uh, so I, I looked up some numbers before this uh, to make sure I was uh, accurate, but it looked like, you know, wind and solar did end up having a pretty good year. Wind uh, was at least projected in November to have a record year and EIA's latest report uh, had wind at 21 gigawatts of additions in 2020. Um, solar had, I think it's third biggest year and, uh, you know, uh, did, did well overall. I think sl some slight delays there due to COVID-19, but overall, you know, considering the circumstances, uh, clean energy did well. And, and I've heard analysts credit that with, you know, a lot of built up inertia from, from past years. If you had to give the sectors a letter grade for 2020, what would you give it? B plus. Okay, good. Are you grading on a curve? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I suppose you all are the professors, so you get to, you get to say the, the nature of the grade, the basis of the grading scale. How's that? So Professor Clancy, we'll, we'll go to you next. <laughs> so I won't repeat what, uh, what, what was just said, but I, I think what, one thing that I'll point to uh, is clean climate tech, what I call climate tech, which isn't necessarily clean tech, but it, it includes other things like circular economy startups and so forth that haven't necessarily been included in the past in that other definition. Um, I felt like it was a great year for that. Um, I, at the beginning of the year, I thought that there wouldn't be as much investment, but it was a tremendous year for investment. Um, it, 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 PwC, I reported that um, they've grown at five times that the investments grew at five times last, I think, uh, over the last five, seven years, they've grown at five times. And so last year was a pretty breakthrough year, despite everything. Um, we also had huge transactions, 600 million for Northvolt, which is a Swedish battery company. Uh, Climeworks got $110 million last year. So if you look at it from a, like, are people going to keep putting money into this sector? Yes. It was a great year for that. Um, I will say I'll point back to to the what what we were just talking about in terms of the 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 industries at, at writ large. I will say one area that was probably not as bright was of course um, the job creation, right? So we we heard that the jobs in in solar, you know, like in all of the the re renewable energy sectors, really took a hit in um, in 2020. And I don't have the numbers. I won't. And you you folks are much follow it much more closely. That so I would say that that was a worry. And then I would also say that. Um, we also were very surprised by the, the growth of the special 
the SPACs, right? So the special interest, uh, the special purpose acquisition companies that really were a factor in terms of the clean economy, especially in transportation uh, startups during 2020. And the letter grade you give this uh, climate tech overall, 2020. So I, I think I would say a B. Um, B plus, B, B, B plus. And when the reason I, the reason I asked about if we were grading on a curve is because frankly, like, holy cow, like all this great stuff happened last year, despite, despite yeah. everything. And that, that's just one thing that I really walked away with when I, when I was looking at the numbers. Good. Uh, Darius, you, um, Heather raised jobs. You, in fact, the lead story on your page right now is a very sizable job loss in clean economy. I think it's twelve percent of the entire clean economy workforce. But has, has not come back. Has not come back to yeah. uh, to market as it were. Yeah, that's it. Your, that's, your thoughts. Uh, your, your thoughts on twenty twenty and a letter grade. Well, a letter a letter grade. I mean, you know, can we say E for effort? I mean, because I think fundamentally this is this is the, you know this is the point that, that you know whatever, whatever you say of this, this has been unprecedented. Uh, you know, inconceivable. Uh, you know what. Um, but actually face down uh, our industries and, and in truth what they've um, what they've surmounted you know you can only um, give, them, give them fullest credit i think um i mean from a global standpoint uh and i think we probably need to look at you know probably have this conversation evolved you're looking at the u.s self-contained and then the u.s in the global on the global stage uh but you know you had 200 gigawatts of wind and solar um projected to be installed by the end of uh, of last year i think i think we made the uh, you know we think we made the made across the line um Fatih Birol, the Director General of the IEA, said a couple of days ago, he said, you know, he said renewables was immune to COVID. Uh, and I think so, well, degrees of immunity, I suppose. I mean, maybe it was just a nasty head cold and, you know, we were shaking it off in 2021 rather than actually being on a ventilator somewhere. Uh, but I think, you know, fundamentally, when, uh, when you look at the U.S., you know, what you saw over the course this year uh, was uh, reflective of the, uh, the Trump-defying uh, momentum that's that's being built up here, uh, both in terms of uh, construction and, and the finance needed to uh, to support that. So, um, going into a Biden administration, I'm, you know, again, <clears throat> speaking from Canada and as a man who lived in the UK for the last 25 years, uh, you know, I don't want to overstep my mark, uh, but you know, you, you've got to find some reason for uh, for real uh, real hope now, especially with the, obviously the. Uh, I, I think we're going to get friendlier to foreigners around here in the country. Uh, this I'm just. Just wild speculation here. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> well, but they will be, they be friendlier to us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop complicating the question. <laughs> All right, Zach. Mike can see me wrestling with myself to not go down political tangents um, yeah. or not, not tangents, <laughs> critical, but uh, he knows how political I am. But uh, I will, you know, you've already talked about solar and wind quite a bit. I will, um, I will just echo, I think everything everyone has said, I I would give a, a B or B plus on a on a uh, grading to to a curve. I would perhaps give them an A, uh, considering how they've done compared to other industries. But uh, but no one's talked about electric vehicles. That's sort of our 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 space a little more. So I will say e electric vehicles. I think did even better, relatively speaking. Uh, particularly again, if you look at Europe, where the market share has been dramatic and astounding. Uh, where you're over 10% in Europe and some Netherlands just had 70%, uh, 72% market share electric vehicles in December. Uh, so you have a dramatic transformation happening there. In the US, you don't have that as much at all because we don't have the same market, but, uh, but Tesla had a phenomenal year across the board in the US. Of course, on the stock market, it's, it's been a ridiculous stock story. So and then you've got all the SPACs, like um, Heather said, like every electric vehicle company you can think of has had a SPAC this year if it wasn't already public. Uh, so it's been a, a pretty wild year in that respect. Um, and in general, I think it, it's there's a lot of positive signs. So I would give that market an, an A or A plus, relatively speaking, because it's done a lot better than I think people expected in such a hard time. It's actually sort of accelerated the transition, I would say, which is, you know, strong. All right, uh, Zach, you're going to have to continue containing yourself from going to politics because I'm asking a um, an empirical question. What do the elections mean for clean economy companies? I suppose in there, there's um, this kind of a sub question, which is in the arc of clean economy, climate tech maturity, 
are we at the age where policy matters less than it did and market f forces matter more than they did or not? But just general thoughts on the changing of the guard at the national level in the U.S. and what they'll mean for these sectors. Um, yeah, I, I love that. I love that the economy, that these markets are strong enough to keep growing and do well. But I'm a person who always says, you know, the more you can have supportive policy, the better to accelerate positive change. Um, I, I was just on a call before this. Um, I'm going to be on a few advisory committees for a 14 state initiative, Clean Cities Initiative, to uh, accelerate EV adoption, better better EV programs like across the EV ecosystem. Um, so, you know, on that call, you know, there's a lot of it's it's uh, you know everyone's hopeful for what the Biden administration wants to do and can do, and everyone wants to do the best to shape that in the best possible way. Uh, as quickly as possible, especially in the next two years, because we don't know what happens after that. And so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of passion that's been waiting a long time and a lot of smart people with a lot of great ideas who are working very hard to try to make uh, a very strong impact. Uh, it's political. So, I mean, you never know how effective it's, you know, you know, one miscalculation and everything get, goes badly. But I think, um, I'm hopeful about what's going to happen in the clean economy. I think there's going to be a lot of quick progress uh, that might not even be noticed much beyond our, you know, our worlds, but will be huge. I think. Heather, what do you think? Yeah, I think it uh, for me it brings two things. One is clarity, right? There's more clarity for the people to make decisions about what they're doing and, and where companies can invest, and, and there's more of a direction, at least at the, the national level. I also, I, I'm anticipating investments in, um, you know, infrastructure is a big focus of, of this new administration and um, they've been promising to build back better. I love one of the things in, the, in the, the new bill that just passed was the focus on carbon removal technologies. I think that is a big um, difference from what we've seen in the past. It really hasn't gotten that much uh, concerted investment. It's kind of dabbling here and there, but I think, we finally have a chance to see some of these technologies get to the point where maybe they could be more cost effective across the ecosystem. But by pushing that deadline for the incentives out to 2025, it really gives this uh, marketplace a chance to, to try things. And there's also mark, uh, money for in innovation, which is sorely needed as well. So I, I like that. Catherine? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that's said. And I think that one thing that's interesting, if you look back at, you know, obviously, under the Trump administration, the, the clean economy continued to grow. Um, but I think a lot of that, when you dig into it was based on this idea that, you know, the market understood that what was happening under the Trump administration was not necessarily sustainable. And they, they saw signals from states and other places uh, who really, really were more aggressive on clean energy. And you look at these utility goals, for example, and they're making those goals in anticipation of policies that are going to be more aggressive. So, you know, the market definitely, it was great to see the market sustain. And I, I think that was in part in anticipation of we are, we are moving toward a, a policy structure that will be more aggressive. Um, so I think it'll be really interesting that now that we have an administration and a Congress that has pledged to be um, more aggressive on, on these policies, it'll be interesting to see how the market responds to that um, now that it's actually here versus anticipating it. Darius. I heard it said that one of the, um, the greatest challenges facing Biden is to, uh, is to reconnect uh, industrial manufacturing policy with energy policy. And I thought that was, uh, you know, a, a, a quite sort of cogent, you know, case uh, there. Because fundamentally, if you consider, the, you know, the biggest picture, the 20th century, uh, you know, oil in the automobile uh, was the wealth generator in the U.S. Electrification of the grid will be the, the generator of, of, of wealth in the, uh, in the 21st century. And for, you know, for the greatest kind of, I guess, sort of trickle down economics, the whole thing, to, you know, to bring as many companies along, not just in terms of power production, but in terms of all the, you know, the widest clean tech uh, sort of, uh, you know, ecosystem. You're going to need this. You're going to need this. Uh, you know, uh, this interconnection, aren't you? And I think you know, offshore wind kind of exemplifies it. Uh, if you're, you know, it's one thing to think about powering uh, Boston or New York or, or Raleigh, North Carolina, with 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 offshore wind. But what we need is to build supply chains 
uh, and that's the great economic development potential, right? And so again, you know, matching, marrying those those two um, policy streams, I guess you might say, it seems to me to be where you know we're really going to see things um, gather pace in you know in the U.S. <clears throat> Already getting some very good audience questions. I want to go to our first one from Kristen Kirsch with uh, Next Tracker. She asks, "Are you seeing renewed focus on the horizon to develop utility-scale solar on BLM lands? And how do you see this landscape adapting to renewables with this new administration?" Catherine, you want to take a stab at that, given how focused you are on the utility space? Sure, it's that's an interesting question because one thing that I have been hearing, you know, in my outlook pieces is that it will be interesting to see how this new administration grapples with uh, regulations, which are, are traditionally, you know, have really heavy oversight on land development. Um, and traditionally that's been focused on, on gas. So, so kind of uh, renewables and environmentalist goals really align there, but but now will we see more of a conflict where we really need to develop solar projects and develop wind projects and develop them quickly, um, but at the same time, you know, are under uh, a democratic administration that that is uh, might might be more strict on on permitting and siting. Uh, so I think it it remains to be seen how the Bureau of Land Management and and the Biden administration and and SIA and some of these groups uh, kind of work together to, uh, to, to figure out how they can um, find some middle ground there. Any of the other three want to take a stab at that, Zach? I'll, I'll just, uh, I, I recall, I'm sure Next Tracker recall, recalls that under the Obama administration, they had a very strong fast tracking program for, for solar on these lands. And I assume Biden would repeat that. I, I mean, I, th I think they, they really wanted to see solar go up as quickly as possible. And I saw this as one of the best opportunities they could implement. So I, I especially Biden being more, you know, moderate, you know, I, I believe that he would um, basically restart that program of fast tracking large projects on, on public lands. Darius and Heather, any thoughts on that? Nothing to add. Okay. No, I don't think so. No. All right, I'll uh, I'll go to a second question, which is um, from Peter Kelly. He runs a, a firm called Renewcom. Uh, he says, "Are you covering the rise of SPACs, special purpose acquisition companies?" Heather, I think you might have even mentioned that already. The so-called blank check companies that that look to acquire promising startups and take them public. There should be more and more of them entering the clean tech space. We'd be curious about your thoughts on the impact on clean tech and climate tech financing. So yeah, we are covering them. Um, I think they will have, they, they continue to have the most impact in the t transportation space. So like um, EV batteries and, and so forth. That's where they've made their mark so far. And I actually don't have a specific reason why that's maybe, maybe Zachary, you have a, a better, clearer picture of that, but um, and a bit on maybe the battery, like the, the, the components for, for the EVs. Um, and, and maybe a little bit also on energy. So like the, the former CEO of, of NRG has a SPAC. And so it's it will be interesting to see what he decides to do with that, um, like wh where they're, where they're going to go. So I, I, I do think it will continue to be a trend this year, though, for sure. I think I think there's mixed feelings in the EV space um, because, <laughs> I mean, on the one, I think I I th I think that part of it is a, a building of, a, you know, sort of tra changes in the investment community that led to this. Uh, but part of it is, uh, you know, Tesla Tesla went through a very long, hard period and came out on top and then exploded. Its, its, its value exploded. It's, you know, it's it's like insane. Like Elon Musk is worth more than ExxonMobil himself. Um, so I think a lot of companies just said, let's get on this train now while it's hot and popping and let's go public and get and raise a lot of money and uh i think the mixed feeling is one that's giving a lot of funding to good companies that could do great things on the other hand there are some companies that probably don't deserve what they've gotten and are going to crash and there's a concern of you know a kind of solyndra type of scenario where a company crashes and it gets all the headlines while mm -hmm. 10 other great companies do great but don't get headlines so i think there's a concern of cr crash and burn story um a lot of companies that have look promising but haven't really demonstrated anything um getting a lot of funding uh 
and uh, it's sort of just a sort of weird game, a weird way of gaming the system to make money quickly that um, people are concerned about. So that's mm-hmm. it. But I was, I agree. It's a lot of batteries, even mining companies are doing it. So um, it's a fascinating thing, but a little scary to me. Yeah, definitely any, scary. <laughs> any any other thoughts on SPACs? All right. Uh, Joe Slater asks, what is the likelihood of a Biden administration implementing market-based mechanisms to curb greenhouse gas emissions through things like a carbon tax, carbon price, or carbon border adjustment? Any thoughts on that? One interesting thing there is there is a lot more support for those policies than there has been in the past and from different groups. We see uh, the American Gas Association uh, the Electric Power Supply Association, all these groups, and and we just had you know the big uh, policy announcement from or policy statement from FERC uh, at the end of last year. So I think that there's definitely momentum from groups. What statement? That, uh, the the Feder- FERC issued a yeah. policy on carbon pricing that essentially said you know this is this is a a market-based solution to to some of these problems, and we would uh, we would review any carbon pricing proposal that would come um, if if an RTO proposed it. And the New York RTO is is one that's close to um, closest to proposing something like that to FERC. Um, but anyway, I think I think overall that that momentum from groups who might have. Uh, oppose such a such a policy in the past could give it more legs in Congress. Mike, I know you I know you're the host, Mike, but you know this stuff really well. I'm curious what your take is on that. I don't I'm curious what you think about that option. <clears throat> I think that to get a price on pollution, you're gonna have to give up very hard fought and hard won constraints on pollution because you're though there though if you look at the fortune 1000 it is rife with large and ambitious and laudable sustainability goals but there is a large subset of that fortune 1000 that they're going to fight like hell against things that they see will will hurt revenue and i think you can make a case that the problem with the carbon tax, the reason why it's sort of the Esperanto of, of um, federal energy policy or pollution policy is because you have to ask people who are trained to be short-term thinkers to be long-term benefit estimators. And in a quarterly return environment of public companies, that's really hard to do. And a lot of great ideas have crashed on the rocks of, you know, in, in various legislative storms. So I'm not optimistic about that. I think that we have to remember uh, two words, Joe Manchin, you know, uh, for people who aren't in this country, he is a very conservative Democratic West <laughs> Virginia Senator. He now is already resisting $2,000 stimulus checks. Um, he is, there's going to be um, a line of lobbyists out his door every day. I'm sure all of them will be masked, but anyway, and he'll be pressured to party switch as well. Heather? Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, two things. One is I think the CEOs that you're mentioning, and I I agree with you generally speaking, but I think you will see that changing a little bit. I mean, I I, I was on a Nestle press conference right before the new year and the CEO of Nestle was talking about how his whole team now on earnings calls is getting much more focused on the short-term investments that they have to make in order to get this net zero goal, right? That they, that they, that many of them are, are declaring. But I actually, frankly, I, I mean, I think that Biden has so many other more important things to focus on, but I just don't see it being a, a focus for at least a while. Um, I just think that sort of, I, I, I'm not, I'm not hearing it. I'm not seeing it at the federal level, maybe the state stuff, maybe there will be things happening at the state level, but I don't. Zach, let me, let me, Heather raised a good point. Um, she's, you know, you, I think uh, James Polk was one of our near great presidents because he said he would set out to do four things and he did four things. And then he told everybody um, that he'd done the four things. So kind of the Lee Iacocca method, you'd 
tell them the three things you're going to say. You say the three things, you say the three things you just said. So very tight contained. Presidential administrations, in my experience, boil down to that dynamic, whether they are promised like that or not. So if I were Ron Klain, uh, President like Biden's chief of staff, I would be willing to lead on meat and potatoes, uh, relatively easy to win things, get ahead of momentum, and then I would get into the grand plans. The, tech, the traditional thinking is we reach big early on, but as we found out from the Obama experience, that's a great way to get crushed. You know, and the reason yeah. they had the wipeout in 2010 that put in the Freedom Caucus and, and, and had the phony cylinder scandal and all this nonsense is because he went big and he went big early. So good for him for doing it, but it came at a tremendous legislative and I would say momentum cost. So I'm rounding out my answer. I'll stop filibustering because yeah, people didn't get I, on to listen to me. I, I was just, I would go back to what Heather said earlier is, and, and maybe Darius as well, that um, I think there's going to be a strong, very strong focus on infrastructure uh, and just, you know, ro- getting infrastructure projects going as quickly and as big as possible. So I think, I think he'll, they'll try to do that in a way, you know, to, as a jobs creator and uh, as a climate to attack climate and i think um they'll focus on doing that in in easier more practical ways than trying to get a gigantic uh carbon pricing bill through and that's my my guess as well of course like heather said as well like we we haven't heard anything about it so i don't i think when you haven't heard anything about it it's just it's not gonna happen but yeah uh, okay, we've got uh, other questions. Uh, Graham Richards, uh, who, a friend of ours, asks, what do you see the administration doing to incentivize additional billions of private funding for accelerating the clean economy? Any thoughts on that? We clearly have an audience of administration-minded uh, folks out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I already mentioned the carbon stuff. I do think that's a newer area that, that we, you will see accelerate. So like carbon related to carbon removal technologies. So I'm going to, I'm going to watch that for sure. Catherine. Uh, I think transmissions poised to be huge. Um, you know, kind of the, going back to the last conversation, it, it sounds like what we were kind of the consensus. I think we all have is that there's a certain order he's going to do things in, right. Or the administration and Congress is going to do things. in. And I agree that you know smaller steps will come before any sort of consensus on on a clean energy standard or carbon price. And I think a lot of, I mean, I hear repeatedly a lot of people say that transmission for FERC and for Congress is is one of those low hanging fruit areas that the administration could tackle early. Okay, but is the question sort of like how he's going to get the investment community to steer more money? It's I, um, I don't have yeah. any answer, but uh, it's uh, mean, curious. It's, it's, is, is there much need, frankly? I mean, should we not ask that question? I mean, fun, you know, fundamentally, I, all I hear from, uh, you know, from boutique investment houses and, and banks alike is it's just money looking for a place to uh, to put itself right now. Uh, and so I think this point about, again, you know, if I, if I may, this point about transmission, and I think probably rightly connected to storage, we talked about that, you know, seeing a fourfold increase in, in capacity, I think, in, in the as a market in, uh, in the last four years under Trump alone, never mind what might happen under Biden. Uh, and that's the connective tissue. I mean, the the, the actual the, the power production, the plant is being built, and it's being built in a clip. And we, you know, that doesn't seem to be the issue. That's that's onshore. Offshore is a whole other discussion. But if you know, if Biden says uh, twelve point five gigs by by mid decade, that would you know make it bigger than Europe is now straight away in, in five years. So that would be a whole again, on billions of dollars are lined up there. You know, all waiting on Vineyard Wind to um, to press the button. So you know, from all I'm, I'm being told, it's not really um, there's no incentive mm-hmm. needed. It's all just the, the markets there. And for the record, though, they, they're, uh, they're friends of ours and a former client. I think Vineyard Wynn is waiting for uh, Biden to unpress the button, the stop button that Trump had pressed just in their defense. But but uh, a follow up yeah. on Joe Slater's question comes from another attendee. Mm. Um, I'd like to know how you see the carbon credit market in the future. Thoughts on that? <laughs> That's a, that's a telling my, laugh. Not my expertise. Can I, can I, can I do, so yeah, so can I do, can I do two things? One is I, I want to just back up just one second to, sure. to an area I'd like to see investment in just to go back to the other question. Um, I think one space where we need 
we need more focus is um, the thermal problem, right? So if we want to decarbonize industry, we need to spend more, we need to have more innovation in, in technologies that can help electrify all of these processes that take a lot of natural gas right now or other or coal, frankly, in the past, right? So that is an area where I think, just as I mentioned with carbon capture, that maybe there could be a, an in, sort of an innovation uh, lens put put into that to, into that sector. That's just one thing I want to throw out. As far as the carbon credit uh, question goes, I think um, the focus should be on on finding ways to evaluate the quality of them, right? And I think what the the, the challenge and the, the sort of one of the concerns I have for this year is that there are so many companies now that have declared we're going to be net zero by 2050. And, the, and they're starting with, with, with some logical things, right? And they, they're going to be using certain strategies in the future. But right now, that means buying carbon credits. And that's going to drive the price and the quality of them down. And unless we get, unless the whole marketplace gets more uh, focused on defining what the quality is, looking at the, and declaring and helping buyers understand this project is good for these reasons. It's not, you know, it's not diverting the carbon from somewhere else. It's right, you know, it's it's going to be have permanence. It's going to, you know, that's going to be sequestered for the time you, you want it. It's not going to somehow be double counted. There's a lot of um, of unclear, un lack of clarity about uh, exactly what what you're buying, and um, and it scares me a little bit that so many folk, uh, companies now are focused on buying them. Good. Any other thoughts on carbon credits? Anybody else? All right. Um, I'm going to reclaim the question order for just for one, and I want it because I, I want perhaps step away from elections and policy and just ask you all, put, on, put your crystal ball in front of you, the three big trends you are expecting to track for 2021. Zach, let me start with you. Well, uh, well, we're, I'm closely digging into the battery market, battery minerals. We have s several interviews conducted and more planned uh, with experts in that field. Um, uh, so that's one one space we're watching. And I guess uh, just focusing on that for a second, there's um, there's an issue that about eighty to ninety percent of lithium and cobalt. Uh, processing pr and production happens in China. And as we shift rather rapidly away from uh, conventional vehicles to electric vehicles, there's a concern that China gets a kind of uh, OPEC-like monopoly over this market and kind of um, screws up a lot of the plans for, <laughs> for making a more democratized, more egalitarian economy on that. So there's a lot of concern about that in the industry. And at the same time, what you need then are big mining and processing facilities in places like North America, Europe, that are not typically huge supporters of mining and processing facilities. So, uh, so you have a kind of this put this balance of you know, if you want a clean, a full clean transport economy, you have to have these things, and if you and we should have them more democratized, less of a monopoly situation than we have today. Uh, and you know, China is very, very aggressive about you know building up capacity quickly. Um, and also in the case of batteries, uh, um, uh, some Korean companies. But uh, but yeah, eighty to ninety percent of of this stuff is happening through China. And um, I think there's going to be a big administrative policy. A push maybe behind the scenes, but a very important one, as well as a market push to try to get more done in, in Europe and North America. And I th that's a big space I'm watching. Yeah. You get up to three trends. You just want to stop at one that's one's fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, in general, I think the EV market has just taken this pandemic as a great opportunity to explode in, in growth. And I think that, I think this, the financial markets, uh, have recognized this very clearly. Oil companies are struggling like coal companies used to. And I think that trend is just going to continue. I think oil companies are going to be in the gutter more than now by the end of the year. Um, 
while EV companies and, and automakers that lead on EVs are going to be shining. And it's a very, very, very sort of uh, scrappy, dirty part of the transition right now. It's very d- difficult. So I think that the whole industry is going to go through a lot of changes this year. Um, I hope to see solar rebound with the pandemic going away a bit. Uh, hopefully, eventually, uh, rooftop solar has sort of struggled through this period. And um, I'm hoping to see that that really blow up more in, by the end of the year. Zach, I want to acknowledge you for not listing Elon Musk's personal net worth as one of the trends you're tracking. I think that's that's a real step yeah. forward in, in the expansion of your consciousness. I'm long. Pa- I, I, I'm not a big fan of that that side of tracking things. But but the whole the the the, the whole general story is quite fast. I mean, Tesla right now is worth like more than every other automaker combined, which is like wild to think about. So there's there's obviously huge things happening in the market that are fascinating to watch. I'm on the I'm on the registration list for canoe you better watch out those guys are gonna love take canoe. It. they're gonna they're gonna just <laughs> tesla you watch and see all right love canoe heather three trends you're keeping track of in 2021 okay they all start with carbon <laughs> <laughs> um so um i mean actually i'm gonna take a i'm gonna take a general thing but i think we should all be watching where the jobs are but that's but that's just an aside okay so i am watching carbon capture and storage and what, what's going to happen with that market this year. As I mentioned before, that 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 new incentive uh, extension is is a big deal. I think I am also watching carbon to value innovation. So, in other words, companies that are taking that captured carbon dioxide and not just sticking it somewhere, but that are, are using it as a feedstock for something mm. else, for fuel, for yeah. a product, for black, you know, ink. What, what have you? I mean, there's, the, and I think that's an exciting space and it, and it turns that, that sort of removal process into a, a, not just a, an expense for someone, but a, a potential revenue source. So I think that's a really um, important area of, of innovation to follow. And then the third is carbon monitoring and accounting, right? So I, I do, the other thing I see happening with all of these commitments is that uh, right now, those commitments are tracked with spreadsheets, right? Those, those numbers are tracked with spreadsheets. And we've been talking for years about how, how people follow their greenhouse gas emissions and how they report them and how often report them, right? It's right now, it's just one, you know, once a year exercise, people go collect the money, you know, the, the numbers from somewhere and try to figure it out. Well, I think we're going to see much more of a, a science put around monitoring. So, sa- you know, satellite monitoring of, of things, potentially using blockchain to track to track the, the impact of something through a, a supply chain. But I think there's a, a potential for opportunity in, in accounting and monitoring for carbon um, statements, if you will. I'm, I'm going to do a, a gross plug for two projects we have worked on. One we're working on, one we've worked on in the past, but both. The thing that's been a head scratch for me for years is in the Department of Carbon Capture, we have this tremendous problem with dead zones around the world. Um, in the Great Lake, in fresh and saltwater bodies. And years ago, we had the opportunity to work on a, a biochar initiative. And it's a complete mystery to me why administrations don't use the U.S. Department of Agriculture to get the ball rolling on biochar, which you don't know is basically a 3,000 year old technology pioneered by, as the founder used to say, by Brazilian housewives, you know, 3,000 years ago, who understood how to burn household waste in low oxygen environments, uh, creating what they call terra preta or black earth. And it's still sought after in to enhance the poor soils in the Amazon basin. Now, the, the rub, as I understood it, was you can't just burn the same mixture everywhere. You have to match it to soil type or you degrade, you, you screw up soil, um, the soil chemistry. But it's, and it has gotten a bad name because people try to burn tires and garbage and nonsense like that. But you actually look at chicken poop, hog waste, and farm waste, and you have huge amounts of it that could be disposed of in ways that actually enhanced soils and capture truckloads of carbon. Complete mystery why it's never been looked at. So, ah, you know, what do I know? Um, good. Darius, three trends you're looking for. Uh, well, let's, let's put a little gas, uh, you know, properly in the spotlight. I think uh, it's obviously 2020 was a watershed year in terms of uh, announced strategies for carbon, uh, well, for net zero uh, by 2050 BP, Shell, Total, Equinor. 
Uh, but fundamentally, you know, we also know at the same time that um, that the you know the, the percentage of their capex is actually going into renewables is minuscule. So I think this is a, a year for them, you know, nailing their their colors firmly to the mast on this, and uh, you know, more than that, uh, you know, actually stumping up with uh, with the kind of sums that we you know will need to see. Uh, I thought it was interesting. A, a report came out of HSBC uh, last week, which fact, which which said you know that big oil can't have its cake and eat it too. It can't look to you know sort of spin off its 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 virtuous uh, you know green renewables efforts either as a, a standalone IPO or, or something like that. And at the same time, uh, hope to see a, a kind of uh, read across valuation come you know sort of reflect well well on them in the markets. So they've got this kind of there's a very much a you know sort of paradoxical situation, which I think is, is going to be at the at the heart of you know uh, what they you know need to resolve to actually see where they go from here. And they have a ten you know this is just the European oil majors. We have Chevron saying uh, saying yesterday kind of cool on the energy transition. We're quite happy with with things as they are. So I mean there's there's a business as usual working against uh, working against the more progressives in in that space. Uh, but I mean oil and gas you know uh, is is interesting if you want to sort of unpack it. On a number of levels, um, you know, one obviously has emissions targets, but uh, but beyond that, there are going to be big players in hydrogen, and you know, honestly, we we are we're being taken over by hydrogen coverage in, on uh, you know on recharge these days. Doesn't data doesn't go by when there's a there isn't a, a new um, you know, the world's biggest electrolyzer is going to be built now by I mean, forgot now was it by Linda. Uh, we had Siemens Energy and Siemens Gnesha talking about uh, about um, prototyping a first offshore wind. Uh, to to offshore hydrogen, green hydrogen uh, production system, uh, and obviously you know hydrogen, you know, oil and gas gets hydrogen. You know they they, they understand it in a kind of cultural way. So um, it's it's a shorter it's a shorter distance for them to travel. And then I think as Heather rightly points out, the carbon capture piece of this. So you look at Northern Lights uh, that Equinor and Shell and Total are running um, in in Norway. Um, again, this is more of the offshore space, but. Uh, you know the potential of actually developing networks uh, at long last. And this is something we used to write about recharge 11 years ago. Uh, you know to begin uh, injecting uh, some of these these large volumes into the um, uh, into the subsurface structures below uh, you know below the the oceans is going to be it's going to be again all part and parcel of this of this sort of role of big oil. Um, and then of course you know offshore wind and floating wind. I'll put obviously I'd, I'd hang um, I'd, I'd uh, put, take a flutter on just sort of picking up pace and then developing uh, you know, even more rapidly than maybe we've seen this point again because the industrial development and economic development argument. Uh, and then probably coming around to storage because again, you know, this is the, um, the connective tissue that makes a variable power source, whether wind, solar, uh, or other, um, uh, you know, more sort of base load, uh, you know, valuable. So, you know, this is, the, but this is again, all this feels like kind of uh, a kind of uh, confluence, uh, you know, uh, around around accelerating the transition this, this year. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I'd uh, probably say. I, I will put a plug in for um, <clears throat> if one gets tired or if one is concerned you're going to miss the narcotic effect of the Trump news porn channel, you can look at the ExxonMobil financial porn channel by tuning into the content from IEFA, the Institute for Energy, Economics, and Financial Analysis, they are doing this amazing dissection of this ring, this, this two-year-long traffic accident that seems to be ExxonMobil's financials. And it says a lot about climate tech, I think, writ large. So I, you know, we do represent them, but I'll tell you, they do some incredible analysis. And it's and and I think to your point, Darius, they 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 are very articulate about the split between the domestic, the U S and the European oil majors and where things are going to go. I don't think what's the big question mark out there are the national oil concerns, you know, Pemex or Amco, yeah. who knows, but um, boy, it's, it, it is, uh, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of um, car wrecks on the side of the road to rubberneck on it. If you're not careful. So well, again, at risk of, I've offered my own plug on this, you know, we have this accelerate newsletter we launched four months ago. And it's you know it's just seen it's it's oil cent it's you know, oil sector centric um, energy transition coverage, uh, and boys are an appetite for it right now because I think you know yeah. such a great deal of traveling blind. Uh, people need uh, need understanding the direction. Catherine, you're three. You're going to be looking for in 2021. You had all this time to write, so that we're expecting them to be awesome. <laughs> Well, and I, I actually published my own plug. I published my 10 trends today. So, uh, well, so you, so I, you I cheated. Okay, that. fine. <laughs> well, it worked in it for a week, but yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I narrowed down my head to, to the three that I think will be, you know, most applicable to this audience. Uh, FERC is, is my number one. Uh, it's been referred to as the linchpin of clean energy uh, deployment. It, de 
clean energy policy deployment. Like I mentioned the carbon pricing uh, statement and what that will really do is it, it sets a tone for RTOs and it'll be interesting to see how those uh, wholesale markets respond. Um, like I mentioned, we're looking at NISO first because they've already had a, a plan in place that they're just working with the state to move forward on. Uh, also with FERC, there's, there's transmission policy, huge, huge appetite for that, that I've also mentioned. Uh, there's also, you know, an appetite to kind of undo some of the, the more controversial FERC policies uh, of last year that a lot of clean energy folks didn't like. Um, and then there's also their DER order that is, uh, we'll start to see wholesale markets implement uh, halfway through the year. So keeping a really close eye on FERC, uh, second trend is electrification. Um, you know, uh, Zach mentioned EVs. I think everyone believes that they're, this really will be the year that they're more, um, EVs are more accessible, models are more available. Um, and then also people are anticipating a targeting of uh, gas utilities, like Heather mentioned, kind of targeting the, the thermal side of things. Uh, so that what we're looking at there is, of course, what that will do to the electric load and how utilities will respond and, uh, you know, how that looks. And then finally, my, the third trend is uh, how utility long term planning starts to evolve. Uh, we're, you know, we're always looking at at that. And I think some key developments there will be whether utilities start more utilities start to make hydrogen announcements. Um, we started to see that at the end of 2020, but whether people start to include that in their long-term projections um, will be interesting it, it also in terms of, you know, whether they're continuing to build out gas plants and they're building out gas plants and saying, well, we can build this out because we, and still have these zero emissions goals because we think hydrogen um, will be the solution to that in the future. <clears throat> um, and then finally with utility plans also looking at whether clean energy portfolios start to come into the mix. Uh, we saw in New Mexico last year, uh, regulators approve a 100% clean energy portfolio to, to replace the capacity of the San Juan plant. So it'll be interesting to see if, if um, we see more approvals for clean energy portfolios, hybrid storage and solar resources to start to replace coal capacity that's scheduled to go offline. Heather, I had a, a pre I had a pre show submission question on um, how much focus there will be on decarbonizing supply chains. Mm. Wanted to direct that your way because there's um, effort we're involved with is trying to advocate for ultra low carbon solar. The concern is that a lot of solar is made with using a sort of coal fired solar, if you will. But just writ large, I know that you know you're. Your, your audience is heavily the, the chief sustainability officers. What's the thinking there in terms of supply chain cleanliness? It's pretty much it, the scope three, if you will, is in is in the commitments of many of the big, the leading edge ones. It's not, it's not everywhere yet, but it's in, in far more than there were at the beginning of 2020. I mean, like Unilever, Microsoft, you, you can pretty much any of those big pump companies have now added it to their, their targets. Um, so they're, Apple has done a really good job of helping its suppliers invest in renewable energy in other markets. They've gone in and, and helped them get the, the policy um, policies fixed in diff different regions. So, so I think there's a, there's a lot more focus on it. The challenge will be, especially depending on, will be where those supply chains are. So, um, you know, are they in a country that's conducive, that has the right policies for this, you know, because pick Japan, for example, they just, they, there's just places that don't have that much um, that, that, you know, as much as we, we complain about the, in the United States about like just how, especially in the last four years, the, the sort of mess of, of um, policies that we have related to this, there's, a, there's just, there aren't policies ever, you know, there's a lot of countries where there just aren't, policies aren't in place. So to, to do something takes a lot more time and work. Um, so Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm babbling at this point, but, no, but yes, no problem. It's, it's, a, it's a focus. Zach, there's another question from another attendee that seems up your alley. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this before, but what are your thoughts about FCEV versus EV for light vehicles? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that story is long told. I think there's no fuel cell electric vehicles don't have, a, don't compete on efficiency, cost, um, performance. So I think that was a debate a few years ago that's that's sort of long 
decided. Um, there's, even the, the biggest automakers focused on that have basically moved away from it. So um, yeah, in general, there's, you know, I'll come back to this as like a closing comment, but I, I talked re recently had a podcast with Mark Z Jacobson, Stanford uh, engineer, energy engineer expert. Um, and uh, just touched on that. And, you know, the, the, he sees a role for hydrogen potentially still in large long distance vehicles, like large planes and ships. Um, I don't think anybody really seriously sees it in light vehicles. Okay. Uh, and then the last question we had submitted in real time, uh, Catherine, I think perhaps it's just uh, for you and for you and Heather, um, following up on what has already been discussed, if Manchin, a cold state Democrat, does give in to pressure to switch parties, do panelists see any climate conscious Republicans as willing to switch the other way to keep the focus on climate solutions? Well, Murkowski has talked about potentially leaving her party. I don't think she would go to the, it sounds like she wouldn't go to the Democratic Party. She would She would become an independent and Alaska's voting uh, allows for that. But if Manchin became a Republican, then I would wonder what the implications would be for, I, I would be shocked if he did that because he would lose his leadership position on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and then I guess go back to ranking member. So I, I would be, you know, I was just reading an interview with him this morning talking about how crucial that position is for him and for his state. So I'd be really surprised if he were willing to give that up. Okay. Uh, and then we'll go to um, the one pre-submitted question before we go to closing thoughts here. So um, the question I have is from uh, my friend Tor Valenza. Congratulations, recently married. Um, he says, my main question to the reporters in this type of form is very basic. What kinds of stories gain your attention these days and what are the best practices for opening our emails and pet peeves for not opening them? You've, we, I asked this question of you often, I suppose we couldn't let you <laughs> off the phone with that. So you can give the same uh, cathartic rants if you'd like, you can, you can enhance them if you'd like, it's completely up to you. But I, this is one where I know all of you will have guidance for, for Tor and people who wanna know this. How do we, how do we clean techers get you clean tech editors to open our emails and pay attention to us? Heather? Read my website and understand who my audience is. Okay. Darius. That's, um, yeah, ditto. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay. under, understand recharge because the mission, I think each of our publications has a very distinct mission. This is true of the, uh, of the real energy media space uh, at large, I think. And also, you know, let's get to know each other. I mean, you know, on phone teleconference because I think fundamentally, we, we live in a world of misinformation. Uh, why, why that shouldn't, uh, certainly shouldn't happen between flax and, uh, and hacks, right? Good. So what you're saying is you don't, Recharge and not have plans to open a, an organic foods vertical anytime soon. Is that? <laughs> well, never say never, right? I mean, I'm just gonna. <laughs> Watch out, Heather. All right, <laughs> All right. Zach. Yeah, I'll just echo Heather as well. I, I have a lot of filters. I don't really get much from newsletters. Um, it it really comes down to the substance. I'm sorry, you know, it's you know, it comes down to is the company really a notable company doing something very interesting in a space that we cover obsess very closely and obsessively. So, you know, I of course I, I catch a headline subtitle or uh, you know a superlative a, a large claim gets attention but it really comes down to is this really a big big deal and um does it fit into our focus yeah. what i hear you saying is you get better treatment if what you say is important beyond your own world and it, yeah. it is useful to other readers that you have yeah and i mean just like like heather said i mean when you read the site and you know how to, t you, then you know our, our style, our focus, and you know how to tailor uh, the beginning of an email to our, who we are. And I think that that has, that gets us reading further. And then it comes down to the, what the content is, right? Got it. Catherine, last word on this topic. Uh, well, I would echo everything that was said. And I, I would add, you know, sometimes we get really, really specific pitches and just our site in general isn't going to cover something that's so company specific and, and we're not going to cover, you know, the latest startup. But but what we might do is we might, um, you know, I still think the most valuable thing that PR and communications professionals 
can add to to me and to my team personally is is sourcing. Um, you know, we we'd love to hear people's voices and the connections you have, but we we're not going to cover you know this really specific company announcement. So got it. All right, we are we are two minutes <laughs> out from close. I just want to go around and ask for um, <clears throat> for last thoughts. Per, uh, I, I guess I'll ask this question because I imagine it's on the minds of many who attend these because they're looking to attend real person events. So many of your companies have convenings. My question is, what will the shows and conferences post immunization look like now that we've been doing all this virtual talking? Any, um, any thoughts on that? Everybody in the world will go. <laughs> Everybody will want to no. go. To, everybody want to get out. What do you think, Heather? Oh gosh. Well, I, I, I if you're going to speak, even if if people are immunized this year, I think this year is virtual mostly, and I don't see people wanting to go back. For number one, their budgets probably aren't there, and number two, people aren't going to be comfortable. Uh, and in the future, I feel like there's going to be a focus on the value of what, what is the value of an in-person event? There's going to be, uh, I think, a, a reshifting of what you focus on there. Is it the exhibits? Is it is it the networking? What is it? Why do you get in that plane and go somewhere and, and need to go somewhere as opposed to watching a session like this, <laughs> which could be virtual, you know? So I, I think they will look different. Okay, Darius? Um, let's let's take uh, Wind Energy Hamburg as a quick quick example because I think it was very interesting to see what happened there this year. We were media partners and we we uh, we covered the the conference sessions. We did um, uh, we did a, a daily news segment on Wind TV, which is uh, which is Wind Europe's platform within that. And what you really saw was the conference side flourished because it was they they did something inventive. They, you know they they made a TV broadcast of this thing for four days. Uh, the exhibition side suffered terribly because networking software. I mean again what value are you going to attach to seeing someone, you know, on screen to, you know, to have that, um, have that coffee and talk shop or whatever else. And I think that, you know, what we've seen at Recharge, we, we shifted our events online, uh, digital roundtables through the year. And fundamentally, the, the reality kind of plays another way too, which is, you know, we held a floating wind event that 1500 people registered to it to, uh, to sit in on. Now, you know, how can you, where can you get that kind of reach uh, in, you know, in a, in a physical world? Uh, except in a massive, a massive hall somewhere in in uh, in Orlando or, or Munich or whatever else, and that's you know I just think it's, we're gonna, we're going to right size our conferences and exhibitions going forward. There's going to be, as I said, I think rightly identifies uh, a very you know a very clear you know, value proposition discussion on on every occasion. And if we and, and moreover, do we have the budgets? Are budgets going to shrink in recognition of the fact we're not going to be traveling as much and never return to to uh, to the size they once were? Uh, will we just re, will we just you know reroute our our uh, our uh, our our, our budgets, our operational costs in ways that are, are more useful to us uh, as, uh, as media platforms. All right, Catherine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally it will just come down to whether or not a company or an event benefited or, or took losses from, from being virtual or not. And I don't, I don't know how event finances work, but I'd, I could see, you know, maybe perhaps some smaller events got, got a larger audience than they would have and, and ended up making more money than they would have. Perhaps some larger events took losses. I think it'll just fundamentally come down to, to those kinds of questions. All right. Editors, I want to thank you for joining with us again. It's been, I think of the four we've had now, this has been one of the best. It's really great. Uh, we got enormous response from people who are sending in these questions. So we will look to do this again in a quarter. And um, we hope that Jan Brandt, who had to uh, cancel this morning because he's got a, they've got a little bit of a COVID scare. Hope everything turns out well for them. And we'll have Jennifer Runyon back with us next quarter to, to join us. So please accept my thanks on behalf of everybody who attended and listened. We really enjoy having you and we'll, um, we'll reconvene this in three months. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye, Thank guys. Bye Thank now. Take care. Take care. Cheers.